Chapter 10 of The Gods of Mars by Edgar Rice Burroughs. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Gods of Mars. Chapter 10 The Prison Isle of Shador. In the outer gardens to which the guard now escorted me, I found Zodar surrounded by a crowd of noble blacks. They were reviling and cursing him. The men slapped his face. The woman spat upon him. When I appeared, they turned their attentions toward me. "'Ah!' cried one. "'So this is the creature who overcame the great Zodar barehanded. Let us see how it was done.' "'Let him bind Thurid,' suggested a beautiful woman, laughing. "'Thurid is a noble dator. Let Thurid show the dog what it means to face a real man.' "'Yes, Thurid, Thurid!' cried a dozen voices. "'Here he is now,' exclaimed another, and turning in the direction indicated, I saw a huge black weighed down with resplendent ornaments and arms advancing with noble and gallant bearing toward us. "'What now?' he cried. "'What would you of Thurid?' Quickly a dozen voices explained. Thurid turned toward Zodar, his eyes narrowing to two nasty slits. Callot, he hissed, Ever did I think you carry the heart of a Sorak in your putrid breast. Often have you bested me in the secret councils of Issus, but now, in the field of war, where men are truly gauged, your scabby heart hath revealed its sores to all the world. Callot, I spurn you with my foot. And with the words he turned to kick Zodar. My blood was up. For minutes it had been boiling at the cowardly treatment they had been according this once powerful comrade, because he had fallen from the favor of Issus. I had no love for Zodar, but I cannot stand the sight of cowardly injustice and persecution without seeing red as through a haze of bloody mist, and doing things on the impulse of the moment that I presume I never should do after mature deliberation. I was standing close beside Zodar as Thurid swung his foot for the cowardly kick. The degraded Dator stood erect and motionless as a carven image. He was prepared to take whatever his former comrades had to offer in the way of insults and reproaches, and take them in manly silence and stoicism. But as Thurid's foot swung, so did mine and I caught him a painful blow upon the shinbone that saved Zodar from this added ignominy. For a moment there was tense silence. Then Thurid, with a roar of rage, sprang for my throat, just as Zodar had upon the deck of the cruiser. The results were identical. I ducked beneath his outstretched arms, and as he lunged past me, planted a terrific right on the side of his jaw. The big fellow spun around like a top, his knees gave beneath him, and he crumpled to the ground at my feet. The blacks gazed in astonishment, first at the still form of the proud Dator lying there in the ruby dust of the pathway, then at me, as though they could not believe that such a thing could be. "'You ask me to bind Thurid?' I cried. "'Behold!' And then I stooped beside the prostrate form, tore the harness from it, and bound the fellow's arms and legs securely. As you have done to Zodar, now do you likewise to Thurid. Take him before Issus, bound in his own harness, that she may see with her own eyes that there be one among you now who is greater than the firstborn. Who are you? whispered the woman who had first suggested that I attempt to bind Thurid. I am a citizen of two worlds, Captain John Carter of Virginia, Prince of the House of Tardos Moors, Jeddak of Helium. Take this man to your goddess, as I have said, and tell her, too, that as I have done to Zodar and Thurid, so also can I do to the mightiest of her debtors. With naked hands, with long sword, or with short sword, I challenge the flower of her fighting men to combat. Come, said the officer who was guarding me back to Shador. My orders are imperative. There is to be no delay. Zodar, come you also. There was little of disrespect in the tone that the man used in addressing either Zodar or myself. It was evident that he felt less contempt for the former Dator since he had witnessed the ease with which I disposed of the powerful Thurid. 
that his respect for me was greater than it should have been for a slave was quite apparent from the fact that during the balance of the return journey he walked or stood always behind me, a drawn short sword in his hand. The return to the Sea of Omin was uneventful. We dropped down the awful shaft in the same car that had brought us to the surface. There we entered the submarine, taking the long dive to the tunnel far beneath the upper world. Then through the tunnel and up again to the pool from which we had had our first introduction to the wonderful passageway from Omin to the Temple of Issus. From the island of the submarine we were transported on a small cruiser to the distant Isle of Shador. Here we found a small stone prison and a guard of half a dozen blacks. There was no ceremony wasted in completing our incarceration. One of the blacks opened the door of the prison with a huge key. We walked in, the door closed behind us, the lock grated, and with the sound there swept over me again that terrible feeling of hopelessness that I had felt in the chamber of mystery in the golden cliffs beneath the gardens of the holy therns. Then Tars Tarkas had been with me, but now I was utterly alone in so far as friendly companionship was concerned. I fell to wondering about the fate of the great Thark, and of his beautiful companion, the girl Thuvia. Even should they by some miracle have escaped and been received and spared by a friendly nation, what hope had I of the succor which I knew they would gladly extend if it lay in their power? They could not guess my whereabouts or my fate, for none on all Barsoom even dream of such a place as this nor would it have advantaged me any had they known the exact location of my prison, for who could hope to penetrate to this buried sea in the face of the mighty navy of the firstborn? No, my case was hopeless. Well, I would make the best of it, and rising I swept aside the brooding despair that had been endeavoring to claim me. With the idea of exploring my prison I started to look around. Zodar sat, with bowed head, upon a low stone bench near the center of the room in which we were. He had not spoken since Issus had degraded him. The building was roofless, the walls rising to a height of about thirty feet. Halfway up were a couple of small, heavily barred windows. The prison was divided into several rooms by partitions twenty feet high. There was no one in the room which we occupied but two doors which led to other rooms were opened. I entered one of these rooms, but found it vacant. Thus I continued through several of the chambers, until in the last one I found a young red Martian boy sleeping upon the stone bench, which constituted the only furniture of any of the prison cells. Evidently he was the only other prisoner. As he slept I leaned over and looked at him. There was something strangely familiar about his face and yet I could not place him. His features were very regular, and, like the proportions of his graceful limbs and body, beautiful in the extreme. He was very light in color for a red man, but in other respects he seemed a typical specimen of this handsome race. I did not awaken him, for sleep in prison is such a priceless boon that I have seen men transformed into raging brutes when robbed by one of their fellow prisoners of a few precious moments of it. Returning to my own cell, I found Zodar still sitting in the same position in which I had left him. Man, I cried, it will profit you nothing to mope thus. It were no disgrace to be bested by John Carter. You have seen that in the ease with which I accounted for Thurid. You knew it before when on the cruiser's deck you saw me slay three of your comrades. I would that you had dispatched me at the same time," he said. "'Come, come!' I cried. "'There is hope yet. Neither of us is dead. We are great fighters. Why not win to freedom?' He looked at me in amazement. "'You know not of what you speak,' he replied. "'Issus is omnipotent. Issus is omniscient. She hears now the words you speak. She knows the thoughts you think. It is sacrilege even to dream of breaking her commands. Rot, Zodar! I ejaculated impatiently. He sprang to his feet in horror. The curse of Issus will fall upon you, he cried. 
In another instant you will be smitten down, writhing to your death in horrible agony." "'Do you believe that, Zodar? I asked. "'Of course. Who would dare doubt?' "'I doubt. Yes, and further, I deny,' I said. "'Why, Zodar, you tell me that she even knows my thoughts. The red men have all had that power for ages. And another wonderful power. They can shut their minds so that none may read their thoughts. I learned the first secret years ago. The other I never had to learn, since upon all Barsoom is none who can read what passes in the secret chambers of my brain. Your goddess cannot read my thoughts, nor can she read yours when you are out of sight, unless you will it. Had she been able to read mine, I am afraid that her pride would have suffered a rather severe shock when I turned at her command to gaze upon the holy vision of her radiant face. "'What do you mean?' he whispered in an affrighted voice, so low that I could scarcely hear him. "'I mean that I thought her the most repulsive and vilely hideous creature my eyes ever had rested upon.' For a moment he eyed me in horror-stricken amazement, and then with a cry of blasphemer he sprang upon me. I did not wish to strike him again, nor was it necessary since he was unarmed and therefore quite harmless to me. As he came, I grasped his left wrist with my left hand, and swinging my right arm about his left shoulder, caught him beneath the chin with my elbow and bore him backward across my thigh. There he hung helpless for a moment, glaring up at me in impotent rage. "'Zodar,' I said, "'let us be friends.' For a year, possibly, we may be forced to live together in the narrow confines of this tiny room. I am sorry to have offended you, but I could not dream that one who had suffered from the cruel injustice of Issus still could believe her divine. I will say a few more words, Zodar, with no intent to wound your feelings further, but rather that you may give thought to the fact that, while we live, we are still more arbiters of our own fate than is any god. Issus, you see— has not struck me dead, nor is she rescuing her faithful Zodar from the clutches of the unbeliever who defamed her fair beauty. No, Zodar, your Issus is a mortal old woman, once out of her clutches, and she cannot harm you. With your knowledge of this strange land and my knowledge of the outer world, two such fighting men as you and I should be able to win our way to freedom. Even though we died in the attempt— Would not our memories be fairer than as though we remained in servile fear to be butchered by a cruel and unjust tyrant? Call her goddess or mortal as you will. As I finished, I raised Zodar to his feet and released him. He did not renew the attack upon me, nor did he speak. Instead, he walked toward the bench, and sinking down upon it, remained lost in deep thought for hours. A long time afterward I heard a soft sound at the doorway leading to one of the other apartments, and looking up beheld the red Martian youth gazing intently at us. "'Kaor!' I cried, after the red Martian manner of greeting. "'Kaor!' he replied. "'What do you hear?' "'I await my death, I presume,' I replied with a wry smile. He too smiled, a brave and winning smile." I also, he said, mine will come soon. I looked upon the radiant beauty of Issus nearly a year since. It has always been a source of keen wonder to me that I did not drop dead at the first sight of that hideous countenance. And her belly! By my first ancestor, but never was there so grotesque a figure in all the universe. That they should call such a one goddess of life eternal, goddess of death, mother of the nearer moon, and fifty other equally impossible titles, is quite beyond me. "'How came you here?' I asked. "'It is very simple. I was flying a one-man air scout far to the south, when the brilliant idea occurred to me that I should like to search for the lost sea of Chorus, which tradition places near to the South Pole. I must have inherited from my father a wild lust for adventure.' as well as a hollow where my bump of reverence should be. I had reached the area of eternal ice when my port propeller jammed, and I dropped to the ground to make repairs. Before I knew it, the air was black with flyers, 
and a hundred of these first-born devils were leaping to the ground all about me. With drawn swords they made for me, but before I went down beneath them they had tasted of the steel of my father's sword, and I had given such an account of myself as I know would have pleased my sire had he lived to witness it. "'Your father is dead?' I asked. He died before the shell broke to let me step out into a world that has been very good to me. But for the sorrow that I had never the honor to know my father, I have been very happy. My only sorrow now is that my mother must mourn me, as she has for ten long years mourned my father. "'Who was your father?' I asked. He was about to reply when the outer door of our prison opened and a burly guard entered and ordered him to his own quarters for the night, locking the door after him as he passed through into the further chamber. "'It is Issa's wish that you two be confined in the same room,' said the guard when he had returned to our cell. "'This cowardly slave of a slave is to serve you well,' he said to me, indicating Zodar with a wave of his hand. "'If he does not, you are to beat him into submission. It is Issa's wish that you heap upon him every indignity and degradation of which you can conceive." With these words he left us. Zodar still sat with his face buried in his hands. I walked to his side and placed my hand upon his shoulder. Zodar, I said, you have heard the commands of Issus, but you need not fear that I shall attempt to put them into execution. You are a brave man, Zodar. It is your own affair if he wish to be persecuted and humiliated. But were I you, I should assert my manhood and defy my enemies." "'I have been thinking very hard, John Carter,' he said, "'of all the new ideas you gave me a few hours since. Little by little I have been piecing together the things you have said, which sounded blasphemous to me then, with the things that I have seen in my past life and dared not even think about for fear of bringing down upon me the wrath of Issus. I believe now that she is a fraud, no more divine than you or I. More am I willing to concede, that the first-born are no holier than the holy therns, nor the holy therns more holy than the red men. The whole fabric of our religion is based on superstitious belief in lies that have been foisted upon us for ages by those directly above us to whose personal profit and aggrandizement it was to have us continue to believe as they wished us to believe. I am ready to cast off the ties that have bound me. I am ready to defy Issus herself. But what will it avail us? Be the first-born gods or mortals, they are a powerful race, and we are as fast in their clutches as though we were already dead. There is no escape." I have escaped from bad plights in the past, my friend, I replied, nor while life is in me shall I despair of escaping from the Isle of Shador and the Sea of Omin. But we cannot escape even from the four walls of our prison, urged Sodar. Test this flint-like surface, he cried, smiting the solid rock that confined us, and look upon this polished surface. None could cling to it to reach the top. I smiled. That is the least of our troubles, Zodar, I replied. I will guarantee to scale the wall and take you with me, if you will help with your knowledge of the customs here to appoint the best time for the attempt, and guide me to the shaft that lets from the dome of this abysmal sea to the light of God's pure air above. Nighttime is the best and offers the only slender chance we have, for then men sleep, and only a dozing watch nods in the tops of the battleships. No watch is kept upon the cruisers and smaller craft. The watchers upon the larger vessels see to all about them. It is night now. But, I exclaimed, it is not dark. How can it be night then? He smiled. You forget, he said, that we are far below ground. The light of the sun never penetrates here. There are no moons and no stars reflected in the bosom of Omin. The phosphorescent light you now see, pervading this great subterranean vault, emanates from the rocks that form its dome. It is always thus upon Omin, just as the billows are always as you see them, rolling, ever rolling over a windless sea. 
at the appointed hour of night upon the world above, the men whose duties hold them here sleep, but the light is ever the same. It will make escape more difficult, I said, and then I shrugged my shoulders. For what, pray, is the pleasure of doing an easy thing? Let us sleep on it to-night, said Zodar. A plan may come with our awakening. So we threw ourselves upon the hard stone floor of our prison and slept the sleep of tired men. End of chapter 10